Professor Franz Rutz per Zoom. Uh, let's give him one moment just to connect. And um, he's going to talk about this dreadful shuttle insect that's infecting our trees and also killing our trees. So, uh, Francois, can you just give us a heads up? Can you hear us? It's over to you. I can hear you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? You've got 20 minutes. Go for it. Okay, let me just share my screen here. Um, share that. Okay, so first of all, I have to apologize for wasting your time. Um, I had completely the wrong presentation in my head today. Um, it's actually part of three presentations I had to give this week. Um, so just to jump quickly into it, and I'm not going to waste a lot more time. Um, so the focus of this particular talk um, is on the deciduous fruit trees. Um, and I know you guys probably had a lot of bad news today, um, hopefully some good news. Um, I'm unfortunately here to share a little bit more of the bad news. Um, so just for those of you that don't know the insect that well, so this uh, polyphagus shuttle borer, um, it's a big, long name, Uvalesi fornicatus, for a very small beetle. It's only the size of a sesame seed. Um, and the initial damage in the tree is also very small. So as you can see there, um, there's a little hole going into a tree there that's on a plain tree. You can see the little hole there that's about a millimeter in width. Um, and the tree reacts by gumming um, or oozing uh, sugars and saps. Um, so the initial symptoms are not really um, very uh, sort of in your face. But this little beetle can cause massive, massive damage, as you've probably heard uh, through the news. So once you open that tree up and you follow that beetle into the gallery system, um, you'll see that the female will drill a hole straight into the, the wood, into the sapwood of the tree, and then start constructing tunnels to the sides, uh, forming a network in the tree. In the process, she would place the, uh, the spores of a fungus on the sides of this tunnel, and the fungus would start to grow. Um, also, she would start laying eggs if this uh, tree is suitable for the fungal growth. Um, and she does not need to mate for the, the, the colony to establish. So if an unmated female starts a colony in a tree, um, she would lay unfertilized eggs, which all will hatch and be male. So you can see the little small male there, uh, the arrow of the brother. These cannot fly. Um, and their only purpose there is to mate either with the mom um, or with one of the sisters. So the mom would mate with one of the sons um, and then they can have sexual reproduction again. Um, and hence the name, Uvalesi fornicatus, or the fornicating beetle. So in that slice of the tree there, you can also see beetles at all different stages. So they have multiple life stages occurring all at once in the tree, multiple generations, which means that they can breed really, really fast. Um, the life cycle from egg to adult is about 30 days. Um, and in that period, they can lay 30 eggs, um, and you can see the populations can grow exponentially, quite rapidly. So the beetles have strange feeding habits. So not only are they very small, so they're very difficult to detect, um, they also have uh, a reliance on a fungus that they eat. So the word polyphagus in their name means that they eat many foods, um, which is actually a bit of a misnomer. They actually only eat one thing, and that is a particular species of fungus. So as, as I mentioned before, when they're digging that tree, they lay the spores of a fungus down in the tunnel systems. If the fungus can grow in that tree, um, the, the beetles will start feeding on the sides of these tunnels. So the beetles don't actually feed on the wood, which is one of the biggest problems we have in trying to control them. Um, they don't feed on the wood, they feed on the fungus. Um, and together, there's a plate, the fungus growing on that. Uh, together, the beetle and this fungus complex can kill a tree quite rapidly. So oak trees, for instance, can take about three years before they start dying from first infestations. Other tree species die within the first year that they are infested. So in South Africa, this beetle has spread quite far and wide. So this is a recently published map um, of confirmed sightings. So this is only places where we um, have a sequence data for the beetle or the fungus. So we know exactly that it does occur in that space. Um, and I'm situated right here at the bottom tip of South Africa, at the bottom there, um, where a lot of the studies that I'm going to report on now has been undertaken. We've also done some work in a natural forest, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to stick to the agricultural things. 
Um, the beetles have a very wide range of species, of trees that they can infest. Basically, any tree species in which the fungus can grow, they will be happy. So currently in South Africa, we have about 130 plant species that we know the fungus can grow in, um, of which in about 50 of these, we know that the beetles can breed. And it's these 50 species that the beetles can breed in that are really in deep trouble. Um, these ones are usually the ones that can die. But to show some of the damage we see in urban areas, so this is a plane tree. You see the date there on Google Earth, March 2017. So this is in Johannesburg. That is that same tree two years later. Every one of those spots, there is a female beetle that entered that tree and excavated the gallery. So in time, over those galleries, um, literally thousands of beetles will emerge within the first couple of years. So you can see how rapidly these beetles can actually infest a suitable tree. This is some really sad looking pictures. Uh, this is one road in the town of George, all of these oak trees. So this is also two years ago. So all of these trees are now gone. Um, these oak trees started dying, showing dying symptoms about three or four years ago. And because of this beetle, they all had to be removed, they're all dead. If you look at the wood there, you can see the tunneling system throughout the branches, throughout the trunks. What this beetle and fungus combination basically does is it suffocates the tree from water and nutrients from the roots and then also nutrients from the leaves going down. So it basically ring box the, the tree on the inside. Um, so closer to home, um, where a lot of deciduous fruit are grown. Um, so first detected in Somerset West in 2019, in a small little area in a block radius there. One year later, it was about half, spread half of um, of the town. This is with some of the control measures that were in place already. Um, a year later, it's infested the entire Somerset West and started moving up the, the R44. And then this year, we've picked it up in, in and around Stellenbosch in a, quite a few different spots. Um, and this is mostly due to human mediated dispersal, moving green waste from Somerset West to the dumping site in Stellenbosch um, and other places. So it really spreads quite quickly and quite rapidly. So that's about what six about six kilometers a year that this beetle has spread from Somerset West. Um, you might have recently seen in the news that um, with the help of some economists, we looked into the potential impact in South Africa that this beetle can have. So this is just a, a summary table of that. So this is in uh, millions of international um, dollars. So, um, so if you look at in terms of the baseline scenario for South Africa at the bottom there, um, that is about 275 billion rand estimated financial loss to South Africa um, if we do nothing within the next 10 years. On that table, you'll see we looked at urban trees, which seems to be going to have the highest impact. Forest trees, that's the natural forests. We have the wattle plantations that we know might be a problem. Um, and then uh, just below that, we have the avocado trees as well. Um, and you would notice in this, this economic impact study that we did here that uh, we, the only agricultural crops that we looked at here were the avos. That's the only things that we had any data for or any information for. Um, and because of this lack of information, we started, decided to start studies on the deciduous fruit. Um, so with Hortco, with some funding from Hortco and also a little bit from WineTech, we initiated some studies to look at um, what could be the, the scenarios we look at in the agricultural areas here in the Western Cape, especially. Um, so we started off with a fungus. So we can work with the fungus um, and be sure that we can contain it because the fungus can't spread without the beetle. Um, and we can put this into trees and things on places where they don't occur already. Obviously, we could not work with a beetle in, in agricultural areas because no farmer is going to let us bring in a beetle into the, the, the orchards. So the, the results is MEC is finished last year. So for grapevine, um, the results were published and it does not seem that this beetle will be a problem based on the patho pathogenicity tests of the fungus. It does not seem like the fungus can survive for more than three months in these hosts um, in the vineyards. Uh, we tried two cultivars only and only one um, growing system, and that's a, a dryland system. So there's a lot of variables that we don't know how they will influence this. Um, the problem that we've seen this year, very recently, um, a month ago, is that we started seeing the beetle moving into a commercial vineyard. 
Um, we started seeing actually targeting vineyards for the very first time. Um, and so what we currently do not know is, will the fungus grow better and survive longer if the beetle is also in the, in the vine with it? Um, so there's a lot more that we, we don't know, um, but we're keeping a, a good, good eye on that. In terms of apple, um, so we started pathogenicity trials on that also with this MSC, and the results have also been published. Um, we were only able to include one cultivar, Pink Lady, in our pathogenicity test there. Um, but what we saw is that the fungus grows really well. So if you look at that picture on the left-hand side, um, that stain in the wood, that's the fungus starting to grow in, in the wood of a, a apple tree. We have also noticed in, in the gardens in Somerset West area, one or two trees that were killed by PSHB in these gardens. Now, these trees are under stress and they're not really uh, sort of fairly old trees. So we were, we were unsure as to what can happen. Um, and as sure as anything, the beetles started moving also into the apple orchards in the Somerset West area. Um, in some areas, uh, a lot of the trees in particular blocks show signs of infestations. We currently do not know if the beetle can breed in these trees, because as soon as the beetle is able to breed in these trees, these trees would be in real um, deep trouble. Um, so there's a, a lot more work to be done here. So we know of one cultivar, we know the fungus does well, we have no idea if the beetle will also do well in these apple trees. Um, and then we also had a particular deep uh, sort of good look at stone fruit, because we have seen from Californian examples that almond trees can be at risk um, so the, uh, of PSHB attack. Um, and we suspected that a lot of the pruner species might be sort of follow suit. So we did some pathogenicity trials, um, which have been submitted recently. Um, and all the, the stone fruit cultivars and species that we tested were susceptible to the fungus. Um, some concern is that we, if you look at differences between cultivars, we haven't found much difference in the, the growth rate of the fungus between cultivars. Um, we do see different growth rates between different species. Um, in that graph at the bottom there, you'll see that the fungus grows faster, for instance, in um, nectarine trees than in plum trees. Um, and these nectarine trees might they be then at higher risk um, from attack. Again, we, up to the study, when we submitted these results, we have not seen it going into to orchards, um, but also as of a month ago, we started seeing them moving into orchards in the Somerset West area. And we believe this is a real big concern because we've seen the beetles um, kill a lot of pruner species in garden settings. So at the bottom there in the study, the MEC study in South Africa, the, the breeding hosts that we know of in terms of, of stone fruit um, or the genus prunus is includes currently almond, nectarines, apricot, cherry plum, and black plum. Um, so these are all highly susceptible to the beetle. Um, this is just in a photograph I've taken of a tree. This is in an orchard setting. And each one of those spots of gum that you see there is where a female beetle entered the tree. Um, we have no idea if they were successful in establishing colonies in these trees. Um, so a lot has to, in terms of research, we still have to do there. In pairs, this is a bit of a surprise to us. Um, we started pathogenicity trials um, at, at Spear, um, but the orchard was removed before we could actually read the results of our pathogenicity trials. Um, but we were having a look every now and again to see if the fungus grows. Um, and we noticed that the fungus does particularly well in, in pear trees. Um, we haven't seen any pear trees in gardens, so we didn't know what was gonna happen. We couldn't predict um, if the beetles would like that. However, now, um, as with the other orchards, we've seen um, the beetles starting moving into pear orchards. Um, and it seems to be particularly fond of pears um, in terms of all the, the fruit trees that we looked at, the, the pear trees have been showing really, really high infestation rates. So you see an orchard like, like that, um, really pretty picture, everything looks, looks healthy. Um, and I think a lot of symptoms can be ignored initially, you don't see it. However, if you look closely at those stems, a lot of the trees start looking like that. Um, so that little stem there, that's one of the trees in the orchard there. And there's more than 150 holes within less than a meter of the ground. Um, and if only 10 of those results in, in colonies of beetles establishing, that tree is very likely to die and, and very rapidly. 
And we're seeing these huge number of infestations on these pears, um, on individual trees, but also on a lot of trees in those orchards. Um, we have not counted the number of trees, but it's, it's, it's more than 50% of the trees in some of these blocks um, that look like that. We've also seen that it's on many cultivars of the pear, so it doesn't seem like there's a cultivar difference currently, um, but these are all things that, that needs to be tested. So we don't know how this happens. Um, we don't know if the, the beetles attack these trees just because their numbers in the surrounding areas are that high um, and they just take a chance, um, or whether this is something that we're going to see generally throughout the production areas of these fruit trees. Taking a little bit of a closer look there also, lots of oozing, lots of sugars. The, the, even if the beetles don't establish in a tree like that, um, the beetles create so many wounds that's going to create so many opportunities for secondary organisms to infest these trees um, that um, even if PSSB is not going to be a problem, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're going to lead to a lot of problems. If you peel the bark back there, you'll see um, those little black dots there. So in the middle of that, that is where the beetle has gone in. Um, that black surrounding the, 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 the tunnel, that is dead necrotic tissue. So those, those tissues are already dead. And then you see these very long streaks, these sort of light brown, um, pinky streaks. That's the growth of the fungus throughout the wood of that tree. So the fungus does exceptionally well in these pear trees. It's, it's better than we've seen in any other host in the country thus far, which is, is very alarming. Um, in this MEC study, we also realized that we need a rapid Yeah, so the good news is that we can now find it quite easily. <laughs> um, we also need to look at other agricultural issues that can cause issues in these, these orchards. Um, we have to look at what are surrounding these orchards, what their influence is, things like invasive species um, that are, can be breeding hosts. We also see that some of the wingbreak trees, like poplar trees and, and uh, beefwood trees, are also breeding hosts, so they can be a source. We do not know if chemical control will work, um, but in an orchard setting, what is nice about that is we can test quite a lot of chemicals and quite, do a lot of screening that you can't do on, on urban trees. So I guess that's a little bit of good news there is that we can we have the opportunity now to go out and test a lot of chemicals um, and to see if we can find something that, that can help. And um, we're also looking into the genetics here. Uh, a word of caution, so once we find a solution for one genetic variant, um, we might have issues with another genetic variant. So there's a second haplotype of the beetle, genetic variant of the beetle now found in South Africa. This second haplotype of the beetle is bringing in a new, a new fungal species. Uh, the species has not been described yet. It's also Fusarium, um, and we have no idea whether that's going to increase or decrease or change the host range of these species, um, of these beetles. Um, so we need to keep an eye also on that and keep in mind that 
the genetics can lead to, to changes, evolutionary changes. Um, this is work with the MSc student, um, also in our, in our group, um, just looking at where the beetle, if we find out sort of the ranges in which the beetles are active and where they can move, we can look at um, sort of trying to establish where they will be a problem. And unfortunately, a little bit of bad news here as well. They have an extremely wide temperature range in which they can move. Um, they're happiest between, say, 20 degrees and 30 degrees, but they also quite mobile below that or above those temperatures. And yes, that's where I'm going to end all my bad news. I'm, I'm sorry for that.